welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. Now to our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. Now, as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This week and for the next two weeks, we are going to talk about one of the most exciting developments in combat air power, autonomy. It's been the subject of science fiction for decades, the ability for aircraft to execute a level of independent decision making that allows them to execute missions on their own. So what we're talking about here is bringing R2-D2 to life. And the way we're going to break this down across three episodes is really pragmatic. We're going to first look at the imperative. Why do we really need to look at this increased autonomy? In the second episode, we're going to look at better defining what we're talking about right now. People are throwing around a lot of terms and they're doing this loosely. It's leading to a lot of confusion. And we'll bring it all together in the third episode, translating what this all means in an operational context. Autonomy in the lab is one thing, but making it operationally useful and resilient is another. So we'll talk about that journey, what we think it'll look like, and consider how human operators will engage with this technology. Remember, tech doesn't exist for its own sake. It's fundamentally about achieving mission results more effectively in a way that buys down risk and opens positive areas of opportunity. So to talk about this with me today and explore why we think a case for increased autonomy in the battle space exists, I've got Heather Penny with us today. Hey, Slick, it's great to be back. And Caitlin Lee. Hey, Slick. As you know, they're both from the Mitchell team. We also have Mike Paco Benitez, who works at Shield AI. Thanks for having me back. Now, many of our listeners might know Paco through his weekly newsletter, The Merge, where he presents insightful and unvarnished insights about what's occurring in today's Air Force. Paco just wrapped up his career in the service at the test wing at Eglin. At Shield AI, he's on a team that includes some of the smartest AI minds in the business. So you add that to his operational resume as an F-15E Wizzo, and he obviously has great insights. Finally, we've got Andrew Scar Van Timmer, who used to fly F-22s and is now with Blue Force Technologies, a firm that focuses on rapid aerospace prototyping. So welcome, Scar. Hey, Slick. Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you all for being here. So to kick this off, Paco, how do you define autonomy? I know we're going to deep dive on this in the next episode, but we need to level set our terms up front. And there's a lot of confusion on just what autonomy is. I mean, there's a difference between autonomation, machine learning, and autonomy, and it gets confusing. Yes, like that's that's a perfect place to start. So as you know, in our business, words mean things. And autonomy and automation, they sound alike, but they are definitely not the same. Unfortunately, the Department of Defense still has no official definition of autonomy. But the good news is there's a few there's a few really great definitions out there. So autonomy or being autonomous is, quote, a system's ability to function within established programming and without outside intervention in accordance with desired goals based on acquired knowledge and an evolving situational awareness. That's the native definition. And although it sounds similar, that's way different than automation or being automated, which is carrying out a scripted task without deviation. So automation and computer science is what we call deterministic. So even if you forgot everything I just told you about autonomy, here's how you can always remember the difference. When you go to the ATM and you get out cash, what kind of ATM is it? So think about that for a second. It is an automated teller machine. It gives you options. It responds to commands. It's scripted. It's deterministic. There's no learning required. Now, imagine you went to an autonomous telling machine. It would determine how much money it thinks you need. And this is what's known as a heuristic or non-deterministic behavior. The answer, it will depend. And it, that answer is determined by how much cash you need, with machine learning. So it's gonna analyze your account balance, its trends, your spend rates, your buying habits, who you're even associated with to predict how much money you need on that day, at that hour, at that location. So if you bring it all back to the ATM, bring it back to the point of this episode, autonomy is what we're talking about here. And that's the bedrock capability required for a number of next generation Air Force programs. One of the most disruptive 
is what we're going to spend some time talking about today is the idea of autonomous collaborative platforms or ACPs, otherwise known as combat collaborative aircraft CCAs. There's a there's an unmanned component of the manned on man teaming that probably your listeners have heard about. And autonomy is the thing that's required to make all of that stuff a reality. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Any other ideas on this from the rest of you? Okay, so I'm just going to say I really love that example of the difference between automation and autonomy because when we think about what warfighters are going to need going into the battle space, we all know that the battle space is dynamic, it's changing. We need something that's going to be able to adapt to those evolving kinds of situations. And automation, because it's scripted, if you think about that in an aerial context, it's a lot like an autopilot, right? You program the autopilot and it stays on the black line and it turns on its turn points and it can't adapt to changing circumstances. So the reason why that matters for our listeners is the autonomy that Paco was talking about requires data, requires repetitions, requires training. So there's so much more involved in creating that kind of autonomy that we need for the battle space. And that's really, I think, what's new, what's different, and what's hard, frankly. Just to pick up on one last point, another kind of big picture theme to point out is that there's autonomy all around us every day. And it isn't just sort of self-driving cars like Tesla. Everything from Google Maps to the algorithms that know and predict what kind of advertisements you'd be most interested in, they're all informed by artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so autonomy is all around us in our daily life and is continuing to evolve. And today we're here to talk about autonomy as it presents within collaborative combat aircraft. But of course, we recognize that artificial intelligence has a wide variety of applications in the the private sector and in the civilian world as well. Scar, what's your opinion? One thing I would add here is, and what is very exciting to me is where we can figure out the best places to continue to use automation where appropriate and then use autonomy where is best suited. As an example, we know that there are aircraft out there that have auto takeoff and land capabilities. Probably anybody who's flown on a commercial aircraft this summer and suffered through delays and the challenges associated with that, your aircraft that you flew on probably had some meaningful automation to enable its auto takeoff and land. We certainly have UASs fielded all around the world that have that capability. You can just simply look at a DJI quadcopter. So I, I'm really excited actually for, at, for us to get into the differences in the best places to put automation, but then really leverage what Paco and the team there are doing on autonomy where it's best fit. Scar, you bring up a really great point. It's not all one or all the other. There are layers within the programs for these aircraft and for these functions and systems where elements of it might be automated and elements might be autonomous. And we just need to understand where the maturity of the system is in terms of why it might need autonomy and how easy or how hard it is to craft that. But there's layers, right? So they'll interact over time. And I would envision this as as a former operator. You would switch between autonomy capabilities in a similar way you'd switch between weapons with your weapon select switch, where you may go forward on the switch to bring up autonomy capability A, go up, aft, or down for autonomy capability C, D, or E. And so I think there is a real opportunity to explore that space. Well, it's clear we've got a lot of ideas going on, and that's why these next few episodes will be really exciting. And for our audience, this is a three-part series. Uh, When we talk about autonomy, we'll be referring to it within the specific context of a CCA using autonomy and an agent to empower a collaborative combat aircraft. So what are the factors pushing us in this direction? I mean, it seems like we're already biting off a lot when it comes to programs like the F-35, the B-21, Next Gen Air Dominance, which we call NGAD. T7, obviously you get it. There's a lot in play here and the Air Force's plate is already really full. Heather, do you want to start us off with this? Well, let me just say that the reason why CCA capabilities and autonomy within the battle space are going to be absolutely crucial is because the force design, so the aircraft that we have, what they're capable of and how many of them we have, that mix, that composition is not sufficient for the challenges that we face today and definitely not for the challenges that we'll face in the future. So American air power capabilities are fragile. And for those of the listeners that have been with us for a while, you've heard us say we've got the oldest air force that we've ever had and the smallest air force that we've ever had. And by the way, our pilot depth 
we just we, we've got a pilot shortage. And so our strategic and operational depth is insufficient for facing those challenges. And we can't regenerate those sufficiently, either real time to prepare for combat or to replace combat losses in the event of an actual conflict. So those kinds of successful strategies against peer threats like China, not only are they going to demand numbers, but we need to have those numbers concurrently at a high tempo and a mass scale to be able to provide the combat pressures on China. And we don't have the numbers of aircraft that we need right now to be able to do that. So CCA are the only ways that we'll be able to provide that kind of mass, that kind of tempo at the same time. And this spans all of our mission sets, whether or not that's air superiority, suppression of enemy air defenses, strategic strike, ISR, or even base defense. So because we lack these capabilities, this quantity at scale, we need to be able to have CCAs to be able to complement that. And when we begin to look at what they might offer in terms of form and function, and then also within the unique attributes that autonomy can offer, we can, can, we can begin to use these capabilities in novel and different ways that confound the adversary, that confuse them, that prevent their ability to predict what we will be able to do in the battle space. So on one hand, the initial forcing function is our need for numbers. On the other hand, these opportunities allow us to exploit those capabilities in new ways that go way beyond just replacing a man in the cockpit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Heather. I just want to double tap that. So if you, if you zoom out, one of the enduring principles of all joint operations is mass. And, and Heather, Slick, everyone, all the listeners, as you know, today's Air Force is the smallest it's ever been. And so all those programs like that you mentioned while they are extremely important, they don't actually address the issue of dwindling mass. They are one-for-one -one replacements that are more capable, but capability is not a replacement for mass. It goes against doctrine, it goes against history, it goes against how air operations work. So SCAR, in his F-22, there's only so many SCARs, there's only so many F-22s, so as good as that, that pilot and that fighter are, they can only be in so many places at once. And so over the course of the past 30 years, the Air Force has gotten so small that we're at a point now where there is simply no viable way to rebuild mass that the nation needs using a traditional 100% manned tactical aircraft portfolio. We don't have the time, we don't have the money, and we don't have the people to do it. But if we jump to a new paradigm, we can rebuild an affordable and capable mass that will create what will be a 21st century Air Force. So to that point, when we talk about mass, it's not just about raw numbers of aircraft, it's also about people and pilots. So how do our pilot training shortfalls feed into this thinking? Yes, yeah, like they're very tightly wound. And one of the things that I implore on our side is that even though we may be building an aircraft and we're gonna leverage autonomy and mission systems to get after CCAs, this all points back to human beings. It is all about the people. And even with the advances in pilot training to include pilot training next, which is a pretty exciting opportunity, UPT 2.5 and, and other advances in technology to enable rapid training, we are still nearly 2000 pilot shorts in the Air Force alone. And ultimately, when you think about going into the combat Air Force as the CAF, for fighters, it still takes two to three more years of training after pilot training for you to learn how to be a good wingman, so a follower first, and then a flight lead, which would be a decision maker, to then make an impact in that operational context. If we are preparing for the highly contested environment conflict, the attrition that we expect plus the long lead of training does not bode well for numbers continuing to stay high, and that deficit is just going to continue to grow. And so just leaning heavily on what Heather and Paco have already said, CCAs have the opportunity when used appropriately to increase the readiness of those who are already and still in while also increasing the combat capability when they end up deploying forward. And so that is where I think there is an, there is an opportunity with CCAs for it to balance both training and operational capability, which there actually isn't another, another platform out there that facilitates that. So, Scar, I'm going to jump in here because I think you bring up two really, really great points. The first is that training piece, right? And so one of the ways that we can use CCA as an adversary air, right, that's the red air, that's the bad guys that, that our pilots will go train against. And it, that's important because 
I mean, I remember when I was flying Red Air, right? I mean, it was very scripted. It wasn't super dynamic. And it certainly wasn't training me to be better at what I was supposed to do in terms of my tactics, techniques, and procedures. So having a CCA be able to be that Red Air enhances our own readiness. And that readiness and that training matters because experience in the battle space matters. We know from historical use cases from Vietnam to Korea all the way back to World War II that when our pilots or when when a pilot force is not experienced, when they don't have that battle hardening, they are really just grapes out there in the battle space. They are easy targets. And so their attrition rate, their combat losses, um, they grow exponentially. So that's actually one of the reasons why we were able to establish air superiority over against the Luftwaffe, against the Nazis in World War II. That's one of the reasons why Japan had to resort to kamikaze aircraft because their combat losses exceeded their ability to be able to replace those pilots because the pilots they were putting forward were inexperienced. They did not have that training. And so that then gets to that second piece that you're talking about, Scar, regarding the, our ability to be able to train pilots. That's a long lead timeline, that to be able to get that useful wingman or that useful flight lead that is about three to five years. That is a really important strategic surprise time horizon. So if you think about it, even though we, we could know we were going to war with a pure competitor within two years, we would not be able to produce enough experienced and useful pilots in that timeline because we simply can't compress that experience. So that's where CCA can be really important because they're not just platforms in the battle space. Because of the way that the software works, because of the way that the learning works, there is no experience time requirement once you build that autonomy. So even though you might have a combat loss and lose a CCA, if you have that platform and you have that autonomous agent, when I say agent, I really mean the brains of the, of, of the platform, right? So when you think about the agent, it's, it's all of those layers of automation, and autonomy that drive the behaviors and the decisions of the CCA, that agent is just as smart as the agent you just lost. So there's no experience lost with CCA. So I think that's another really important element of how CCA complement and augment our capabilities within the battle space. That's a great point, Heather. I just wanted to, to double tap a couple of those things. So by my math, I think we're on the Air Force is on a 13 consecutive year shortfall of fighter pilot retention. So that is a that is a compounding uh, emergency procedure. We are getting into a critical phase where we have to do something different. Yeah, and when, that's so when right. One of, those, one of those pilots exits. You know, they exit with ten years of experience. And so the you know the common phrase, how long does it take to build a ten year experienced uh, fighter pilot? Well, it takes ten years. So with CCAs. I think the answer becomes, it depends, because as you said, you can use machine learning and you accelerate the behavior development of some of this autonomous agents. And, you know, once you build, you know, how long does it take not just to build a, that 10 year experience fighter pilot, but how do you, how do you, how long does it take you to build like the world's best wingman, that loyal wingman? Like, well, if it takes, you know, four years, great, that's per person. And then I have a standard deviation for human behavior, performance, what they eat for breakfast. But if I have a CCA, that's the best wingman in the world. I can copy and paste it infinite number of times. And so the attrition factor starts to become less of a factor and more of an enabler because now we can accept more risk as we, we kind of put those through the pipeline. What I want to hit on is as Blue Force Technologies is an aerospace manufacturer and we're building an unmanned aircraft for at air purposes, we as a manufacturer, like everybody else, are tracking supply chain challenges. That is the thing that's hitting everybody in this post-COVID era we need to start thinking about our pilot proficiency, readiness, quantities as a supply chain. This gets exactly into what Heather and Paco are, are talking about. Our, we have a supply chain of pilots, and we need to con contract that and find other ways to enable their capabilities. Just like on the manufacturing side, you have to identify new sources, new ways to contract those timelines so you can stay on time. One uh, point I just wanted to add to build on this conversation about the role of the human and how it's changing as we bring more artificial intelligence into our force is that the CCAs have application not just for adversary air, of course, but for our blue forces. And so one of the huge sort of questions, I think, for the Air Force as we move into this new era and sort of move beyond our current generation UAVs is how do these CCAs fit into the force structure? And so to this point about 
the pilot pipeline, one of the things we really need to do is start to integrate these a new generation of CCAs and figure out what the pilot's role is now and how it's changing and how the sort of the job of the pilot or maybe just the human controller changes. Is it someone who's controlling the CCAs from another aircraft or is it someone still in a ground control station like we have today? That all depends on the kind of artificial intelligence that we use, the kind of AI brain that's put into the CCAs. And I think one of the things that's going to be really interesting to see in the short term here is the Air Force seems really interested in, in purchasing the, the Australia's ghost bat. And so as they, if, if that actually ends up happening, that'll be a really quick turn way to put the proverbial rubber on the ramp and start to play with these things because there's these huge force structure questions. When you start talking about artificial intelligence, it's what does this human machine interaction look like and what's sort of fascinating is that fascinating is that sounds like sort of a theoretical question, but it's going to play out in the force and the way that people's jobs materialize and change over time. So I think this is going to be a really interesting question to see both on the red side, but also the blue side, how the CCA integration goes and how it changes, how many pilots we need, how quickly we need them, how much we worry about attrition, and what the actual role of the pilot is and how that changes over time. Caitlin, let's tease this out some more. You recently executed an in-depth workshop with some serious actors in this area. So what did you learn about how the participants in the workshop were thinking about using CCAs? As I understand it, you had uniform folks from the Pentagon and the command science and technology experts, plus some industry folks as well. Yeah, so the idea behind the workshop was to bring together all the sort of stakeholders in the CCA community from industry, OSD, Air Force, and both operators and engineers to think about where CCAs might add value, particularly as we look to great power conflict. And so for the exercise, we brought these players together and we looked at a set of penetrating strike missions. And we asked the players to think about how CCAs might fill critical capability gaps. And some of the big takeaways were that actually some of the penetrating strike missions involved so much risk, particularly those that involved strikes over mainland China, that the participants felt mission commanders would never execute those missions without CCAs and that the CCAs were able to drive down risk significantly, both risk to mission and risk to force. Another big outcome that was interesting was that the participants all seemed to want to design larger numbers of CCAs to fill capability gaps, particularly for counter air missions and ISR. We didn't close off any possibilities. The workshop participants could have built very capable, exquisite unmanned fighters or bombers, but that was not how they chose to design the CCAs in their workshop. Instead, they wanted larger numbers of CCAs with disaggregated capabilities, less capable CCAs, and that was to bring mass to the fight. And of course, with the Air Force kind of smaller than it has been in a long time, bringing that capacity was seen as a key enabler and also something that would impose costs on the adversary, forcing them to expend rounds on large, larger numbers of systems and complexity as well, forcing the adversary to make tough choices between which CCAs to target. So again, driving down risk was a, a huge sort of value proposition, as was building larger numbers of CCAs. So I just want to follow up with a question about risk. And I think that Paco mentioned it earlier that CCAs seem uh, to be lower risk, right? So how did you see that play out during these theoretical missions in the workshop? Yeah, great question, Slick. So so what we did was on the first day, we asked teams to mission plan for a 2030 Taiwan fight. And we, we, we kind of assigned them these three different mission sets for penetrating strike. And... Um, what they told us initially was, and so they designed initially their mission planning without CCAs. So they just use a blue 2030 force that did have B-21 bombers, of course, for the, B for the strike mission, but still largely looked like the force that we have today. And so we asked them, well, well can you, how, how, how hard or easy is it to do this mission? And then when you enter, and where, where are the gaps? And then when you introduce CCAs, how do, to what extent do CCAs potentially mitigate those gaps? And the way we initially framed the question was, how much operational advantage do CCAs provide over that sort of base force that you built without the, without the CCAs? And what we quickly realized was we were asking the wrong question, because what the players told us was that in these scenarios, particularly for those strikes on mainland China, whether it was the air base attack or tell hunt, the mission commander never would have allowed that mission execution in the first place. There was just too much risk involved. And what they said was that when we introduced CCAs, that started to drive down the risk. 
And over the course of the workshop, we asked the players not just to tell us uh, once you introduce CCAs whether it drove down risk, but we then asked them to think about whether they could even trade off attributes of their CCAs. So like reduce the payload on the CCAs, whether it was air-to-air missiles or radar, things like that, and just to get the cost down. And once you do that, you know, does it still reduce risk? And the answer was a resounding yes. And so what we found was that rather than thinking about, well, how do CCAs actually improve my, my operational effectiveness? The question is actually, how do CCAs drive down risk, at least for penetrating strike, and make missions that previously didn't seem executable within reach? Okay, so what I'm hearing is that core missions still exist, things like air superiority, electronic warfare, and more, and autonomy helps us pursue a new generation of aircraft that can help address these missions effectively and in a way that avoids some known challenges like cost and personnel training time. Do I have that right? Absolutely. So I love what Caitlin did with her workshop because I think that really brings to bear, and I'm going to foot stomp this, is that they identified mission gaps because there was not an option for a manned counter air, right? So those are mission gaps. But what she really found was that instead of just saying, okay, well, we can replace that with CCA, is that the CCA lowered the risk and changed the calculus of the commander in his willingness to be able to actually even just execute that. So it wasn't just a remove and replace, and it wasn't simply just, oh, hey, we don't have humans in the cockpit, so we don't care whether or not they're attritable. It was that the operational concepts that those CCAs enabled and the way that they were able to disaggregate capabilities, make those trade-offs, lower actual costs, so we're talking dollar signs here, through the ways that they did those trade-offs, and they were able to complicate the adversary's targeting, so they were confounding the targeting, actually protected the humans in the battle space, and really enabled different ways of doing things. And so I think that's really important. This isn't simply about, hey, it's a tradable because there's not a human in the cockpit. It's that there are things that CCAs can do because of the form factor, because of disaggregation, and because of the autonomy that enable us to do new and different things that will make us more effective. Yeah, that's Heather, that's a great point. So I typically hate using the word game changer, but to your point, this this is a, a game changing capability. And I and I define that by two things. Number one, it brings new concepts to the table that otherwise would not have existed. And then number two, it changes multiple paradigms. And you talked about a few of them. So if you put all that in context, you know, CCAs aren't just the, the, the path to, to building a bigger, better Air Force, but really to build a, the 21st century Air Force. And so the number of paradigms that CCAs have the potential to to change happen to be all of the paradigms that have been increasingly constrained the Air Force. Things like risk to force, risk to mission, cost imposition, cost per effect. And oh, by the way, we're not the only ones who believe that. You know, China, you know, who everyone's looking at, they're doing the same thing. They're Man on man teaming concept is based on a CCA called Dark Sword, and that's going to be envisioned to be a loyal wingman for their twin seat J 25th Gen fighter and their H 20 stealth bomber. And oh, by the way, Russia, they have two different known CCA efforts. The main one is pairing their, their S 70 stealth drone with the Su 57 Felon, their fifth gen fighter. Yeah, no, I, I could not agree more. So these things are additive, but humans still have an important element in the fight and in the on man aircraft. Paco, Scar, thoughts on this? Yeah, Paco, I'll jump in quickly first. There are two main things that we still want people to do. Number one, I think we'll find universal agreement on this. Philosophically, the employment of weapons can't be without human interaction and intervention. We are not giving the CCA carte blanche capability to say, this thing is hostile and it has a human inside and there and I'm going to shoot a, my weapon at it in order to neutralize that threat. I think we still philosophically the we need to have humans involved in that. And then second, secondly, quickly is is abstract decision making. There are many things that we do through our tactics, techniques and procedures that we try to make as black and white as possible. So they're repeatable, they're easily digestible, but also still adaptable to specific situations, there are things that happen in combat that we can't imagine, certainly in the highly contested, heavy EA kinetic environment that we envision, where there will have to be abstract decisions made against stimuli that we haven't seen before. 
that is another place where humans will continue to play a critical role because they will redirect the CCAs. That doesn't mean that the autonomy didn't work. It just, you're going to enable its directive autonomy to go somewhere. You're going to direct the autonomy to go execute somewhere else other than what it otherwise would have done. And so weapons employment, abstract decision-making are two areas that immediately come to my mind as far as where we still want humans to play a, a very important role. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So if I remember a couple of years ago, Elon Musk made some headlines when he went to one of our Air Force conferences and he kind of stood up and said the the, the era of the uh, human fighter pilot is over. What he what he failed to recognize is that war is a human endeavor. The fog and friction of war and all the evolving uncertainties, and not just in conflict, but even in dynamic training, making sense of that environment, that perception and rational actions uh, even harder. So I say that to say that when this is probably the most important part of this conversation today. So I want to foot stomp something that's called Kasparov's Law. So this is a phrase that I hope as we continue the discussion on CCAs, man-to-man teaming, that this this law and this discussion becomes part of, of all of that in, in our vernacular. And so it was named after a guy named Gary, Gary Kasparov. He was a grand chess master back in the 80s and 90s. He was famous for defeating computers until one day he didn't. And he lost to IBM's Deep Blue back in uh, 1997, I think. Then he became obsessed with AI and chess. And so what he eventually discovered, what it was not about man versus machine, but it was all about man and machine. And so he invented what's called advanced chess, which is man-on-man teams competing against other man-on-man teams playing chess. And so to be effective it was discovered that the operators have to be familiar with their machines and know how to best employ them. And after all of that, this resulted in what's now known as Kasparov's law, which is machines can and will be beaten by man on man teaming bar none every time how it's done that the best way to do it is weak human or average human plus good machine plus better process beats a strong human, a decent machine and an inferior process every time the human is a critical component and the process is a requirement. The better the process, it trumps the better human every time. So I think this also brings up a really important element is that both of you were talking about the humans and the, and the human machine teaming, the man machine teaming. It also begs the question, what are humans good at and what are the machines good at? And Scar, you mentioned this, right? It's about the judgment. It's about the, the human's ability to be able to see through uncertainty, to be able to do those kinds of that, that kind of interpretation and make meaning within the battle space, especially when we're presented with something that is new, novel, different, confusing. And so that's really a critical piece of that. So as we begin to develop the the unique operational concepts that Caitlin was was discussing and how we do those interactions, I think it'll be really crucial. And this then, Paco, gets to your point about how you build those teams is understanding what are the humans good at? What are the unique attributes of the CCAs and how do we want to exploit that? And then how do we build those interactions? How do we build the teaming element of that? And I think that's something that right now often gets lost because we think about just deconstructing a mission into its mission's tasks and we're not thinking about how we do the teaming. Okay, so just for clarification, how is this teaming that you talked about different than the types of teaming we see today with current RPAs? So the current generation of RPAs, the pilot is physically separated from the aircraft in a ground control station, but the pilot is controlling that aircraft through data links. And so there's constant human input into the machine. But as AI starts to evolve, that introduces a third actor into that human machine interface. And so it's no longer always the human directly inputting to the machine. Sometimes the machine is going to be sort of orienting itself in its environment and making some pre-programmed decisions. And so that relationship between the human and machine and where the control resides will start to shift. Wow. So, uh, Caitlin, you know, to your point about um, remotely piloted aircraft and, and loyal wingman, it's probably good to compare it to the original loyal wingman, the skinny little AIM-120 radar guided missile. So that's an active missile, but it performs a mix of tethered and untethered operations. So what that means is you know, in theory or in principle is how it works. You point it in the right direction, you give it a task and you send it off to do its business. All along the way, it's trying to make sense of the environment. And when it sees what matches what you told it, 
it untethers itself from the human and then completes its task. So that's probably a little bit better of an analogy of where we're trying to go. And oh, by the way, we've had that capability since 1991. So that's not, that is an analogy of autonomous low wing, but it's not an exact example, but you kind of get the point. Let's talk about the evolution of this technology that Caitlin mentioned. What does crawl, walk, run look like for this technology? And I'm guessing this will be an iterative journey like most forms of new tech. And Paco, uh, you're working directly on this. Can you give us a rundown? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to say that the crawl, walk, run, it's more like walk, run, fly. So if we start to get the fly and work backwards, Shield AI has what we call agents, and those are behaviors that do specific missions and tasks. We're going to have those flying in a couple of months in flight tests at Edwards for DARPA and the Air Force under a few different programs. And those agents are, are going to demo within visual range and beyond visual range air-to-air -air behaviors. But everyone sees those behaviors, and in some cases, we put them in VR, and you can actually have a human fight against it. That's car can tell you a little bit about that. And it's really exciting. It's fun to watch. But the behavior is just a very small part of the whole package. So I could talk about the rest of the pieces and we'll have a few episodes to, to, to kind of unpack that. And there's a few other projects that are going on mostly in ST and and research, a little bit development, mostly research. But I do want to highlight one program that's really important to pay attention to in the realm of autonomy and addressing all of those things that Caitlin's talking about. So this is called the Unmanned Adversary Air Experiment, the ADAIR UX. Air Combat Command is leading it, but it's being executed by AFRL's Experimentation Office. And there's three things that are really exciting about this project when I look at it. The first one is it's the only tactical autonomy initiative with its line item in the DOD budget. The only one. And so that's really great when Congress wants to help the Air Force and put their hand on the throttle and push. The second one it's solving a real problem using tactical autonomy, but in a training environment. And so like what Heather talked about, you know, flying red air is, uh, is, is a somewhat scripted when you have some dynamic responses, but this program is developing agents to fly as multi-ship red air to train humans. And so those red air presentations are pretty familiar to, to most fighter pilots out there. But more importantly, the controlled setting of being in training it eliminates so much of the fog and friction of war that you can focus on a very finite scenario and a very finite geographic airspace with some control mechanisms. And that's really helpful to really nug down the details that are required to accelerate the concepts and the adoption and the integration of this technology. And then the last one is it's the only program right now that is forcing everyone to come to the table with a holistic end-to-end -end view of autonomous vehicle adoption and operation. And when I say end-to-end, -end, I'm talking planning to debrief and engine start to engine shutdown. And so Adair UX is a great way to advance what I call the two TRLs. So the first one is probably familiar to some listeners. That's the tech readiness level. So one through nine, nine's fielded, one's an idea. But the more important one for this concept is what I call the trust readiness level. And so both of those need to be advanced concurrently for CCA to ever be used by the warfighter. You can get it to a tech readiness level nine, but if the warfighter hasn't interacted with it, doesn't trust it, doesn't know what it is, they're not going to use it. It doesn't matter. And so Adair UX is really focused on this. And Scar is is intimately involved in this program. So I'd like to kick it over to him to kind of build on that. Yeah, thanks, Paco. I think we, you and I have a lot of alignment. And as Paco alluded to, I actually was supporting DARPA ACE with Heron, now Shield AI. And I completely agree that the most valuable part of DARPA ACE is actually TA2, which is the trust development, trust measuring, and in trust expanding part of DARPA ACE. There is some awesome capability going on in the autonomy development, not to minimize that at all, but the trust, as the operators in the room know, is critically important. You have to build that trust in an iterative way. We do that right now through basic mission qualification, basic training, mission qualification training, flight lead training, IP upgrade, and you can watch and develop somebody through their entire growth and maturation in the weapon system. Adair UX has a real opportunity to do just that because there are a lot of things when it comes to dot mil PFP in CCA's relationship with the FAA, with ATC, with airfield ops, with maintenance that we have to get right if we don't get that right, then we already start at a trust deficit. And the tech can be amazing, but the non-technical challenges are going to be what stop it. And the reason why Adair UX is, is so meaningful is because we have to practice, and this gets back into readiness, 
and that supply chain of combat capable pilots. We have to be able to practice every single day against threat relevant capabilities. If you think about an NFL team, the NFL season is starting. I'm a sorrowful, sorrowful, eternal Detroit Lions fan. And when the Detroit Lions have their practice squad and they're getting ready to go against, say, Tom Brady, the practice squad quarterback doesn't emulate a dual threat quarterback. He emulates a pocket passer. And that is what you do with adversary air and the aggressors every single day. The aggressors put up the capabilities that we expect to see out of our adversaries. They don't put up our exact blue capabilities. That enables that sparring partner mentality of iron sharpening iron, where you increase the readiness. And when that CCA, the unmanned adversary air UX platform, doesn't hit you, doesn't hit the ground, and provides meaningful training, then that trust factor is just can't help but increase. The other thing I'll say here too, when it comes to CCAs, if you want to play and fly with fighters, you have to have a performance like a fighter. And so if you want to emulate or be a a, a J20, as an example, CCA, you have to have the relevant capabilities of that. And that's exactly what the Adder UX program is asking for. And Blue Force is excited to collaborate on that. The other thing I'll say as well is that the behaviors associated with adversary air and blue air are actually quite interchangeable. If you think about a stern conversion, say, where you have one aircraft that rolls up behind another, if you see any of the Top Guns, you'll see you know, that you have a, a, a Super Hornet or Tomcat fly behind another aircraft before, just before it was in front. So call that a stern conversion where you roll up behind. That stern conversion is a behavior that we would expect our adversaries to do if given the chance. And so if you envision an HMI or human machine interface controlling his aircraft, the drop down menu in that case would say red. Turns out, Paco and I know, Heather, you know, all the operators listening know that a stern conversion is also a blue air behavior. And so if you select the drop down from red to blue, now you've actually used this aircraft in a operational, you know, HCE potentially way. And so I think, I think what Paco's getting at, and I certainly agree, is, is that Adder UX has some real capability for training, but it shouldn't just be binned in that way. It really honestly is developing an operational prototype to get after these exact CCA challenges. And I'm so happy that this program is, is continuing on. So just to wrap that all up with a bow, I think what's really important about the Zad Air program is as part of that crawl, walk, run, or walk, run, fly mentality is getting these aircraft in the air with real users forces all of us as an enterprise across industry and across the Air Force and across warfighters and technologists to bring a pragmatic capability to the warfighter and think of it from the nuts and bolts and all of the administrivia, all of the details that aren't the sexy elements that folks are focusing on in research and development. So it actually begins to make this a real capability pragmatically that we can employ and where we've thought about the entire requirements across the life cycle of use. All right, we've covered a lot about CCAs today, but does this mean that we can take our foot off the gas with platforms like the B-21, F-35, and other new planes that we're fielding today? Yes, like I I don't think it does just because we have only a few hot production lines and we do have a sort of shrinking capacity problem. I mean, if you look, you know, we recently did this project examining penetrating strikes, so we were looking really looking at our bomber force. And if you think about bomber kind of availability on any given day, I mean, it's not great. You know, bomber readiness levels, mission capable rates hover around like 50%. And then you always have some on nuclear withhold. So when you actually talk about like ready to go war fighting capability, you're getting down into very low numbers. Like bomber availability is something on the order of tens, not hundreds. And so when you think about that capacity issue, it's just we need everything we can, especially for the Air Force, which is really in a unique position, you know, because... Air, air power is a power projection capability that gives you like so much range and flexibility. Given the sort of strategic challenges we face, it's really got to swing between theaters and it's got to do so very quickly, more than, more than perhaps the other services the Air Force has to worry about being able to have the capacity to go hit some problems in the Indo-Pacific, but then also having capacity to swing and do other missions in the European theater. And oh, by the way, our countering violent extremist organization priorities haven't gone away entirely. And so given those mission sets, it's important to have some way of generating capacity. And so letting go of hot production lines just 
doesn't seem sensible, particularly at this time. And and then when you think about when we even talk about CCAs, one of the big foot stomps or reasons you hear the Air Force talking about them is this potential to bring mass to the battle space. And so capacity is clearly a huge issue. And so letting go of things that are already being produced doesn't seem to be a sensible approach. Okay, Atlanta, I, I really appreciate that. So Scar, as a fifth gen F-22 pilot, you were in a jet that was incredibly automated, it used a ton of processing power and fuse integration. So how does that inform how you think about this next step in tech development? Yeah, absolutely. So like, I think very similar to the F-35, the Raptor features a whole host of automation. I think when we take a step back and realize you know, how much of what we do on a daily basis, which has been alluded to, uh, has either aut- automation or autonomy baked into it, it'll really just create the space for us to be open to autonomous capabilities and what we want to lever upon them. All right, so far we've just been talking about the strengths of this new technology, but does autonomy afford new elements of vulnerability that adversaries can exploit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll skip the cyber resiliency and the anti-tamper aspects by saying that autonomy should be treated no differently than any other exquisite military avionics. Moving past that in the near term, if, if we assume that the, the concept of operations for, for fielding CCAs is limited scope, limited mission with with tethered only operations. Yeah, there are definitely vulnerabilities with comm jamming loss link that have to be recognized. Now, long term, as you get into mature, trusted tactical autonomy that can move between tethered and untethered operations, that's what I would call full operational capability. And then you get into not necessarily the comm jamming and loss link, that's not a factor, it becomes the behaviors. And so behavior wise, it's a balance in anything, just like a human, when you train based on what they're expected to operate in. And so when you see large deviation deviations outside the scope of what you're expected to see, whether you're an agent or you're a human, and it looks different to their sensors, it may elicit a negative reaction based on its, its observation space if it hasn't been trained for that edge use case. And that's no different than what most of us are familiar with in the counter and counter countermeasures in the IR missile game that we've seen over the past 50 years. So a human example of this vulnerability is a, a human. I have a young wingman who is operating a radar and he is getting an advanced jamming in his sensors, but his sensors have not been programmed to negate it. And so he may be led down a wrong path based on incorrect information coming in to, to make a decision. The autonomy example, a Tesla is a great is, is a really good one to look at. There's some, some really good YouTube videos out there with phantom speed limit signs or people putting post-its to change the numbers on the signs and the vehicle responding. My favorite one is put a projector showing people in front of the car and the car started maneuvering in relationship to the projector image. But a real human could tell that's just a that's just a projector. It's not an actual real person. All right, I apologize. We're always running tight on time on the Aerospace Advantage, but thank goodness we've got a couple more episodes. Paco, are there elements of the Air Force that need to reform to on-ramp this new technology? And what I'm thinking about specifically is testing and evaluation. Yeah, real quick, when we talk about autonomy and CCAs, there's two parts. There's V and V and T and E, and both are required to actually field the autonomy for CCA. So real quick, V and V is the first one. That's verification and validation. That is a software-centric process that basically allows an independent verification of trust for the design, and that's using mathematical analysis and some other simulations. The Jake, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, they're the people in charge of developing what that's supposed to look like. We have not seen any published standards or processes yet for tactical autonomy, maybe by the end of the year. The good news is Shield isn't waiting. We've already developed our own internal VNV tools and processes. The second one, which is really important, is the test and evaluation that happens after vnv and that's where the autonomy is assessed whether it meets the mission requirements and really if the operators have established trust in it and so tactical autonomy is advancing really quickly but it's going to need a place to go for test and evaluation today the only real capacity that to, to do that is the x62 and the x58 there's only one x62 vista in the whole world and there's only two xq58 valkyries that are possessed by the air force and so we run into a capacity problem. The primes don't have a test fleet either, by the way. And so what's something that's really exciting, it's really important to take away from this is that there's a project called, uh, it's called Project Venom. 
It's a very nascent joint DARPA Air Force program to take some F-16s that were going to be divested and instead modify them to host autonomy and then use that as a backbone to stand up a tactical autonomy test unit. And that'll give you the sets and reps for autonomy, the increased touch points between the softwares and the humans that build trust. And I'm not being dramatic when I say without something like that, the mature the maturation of autonomy and the feeling of CCAs will grind to a halt. Yeah, no, Paco, you're uh, spot on. So to wrap this up, where do you want this technology to be in a year, two years, and then let's say five years, and we'll go Paco, Scar, Heather, and then Caitlin. Awesome. Thanks. Like, So Air Force Chief of Staff General Brown was recently asked the exact same question, and his answer was perfect. He said, quote, we have some work to do. So if there was a CCA platform and sensor ready for the warfighter in five years, I will say that the autonomy software will be sitting there ready to upload and go fly. Getting the autonomy out of R and into D, so out of research and in development, is not a technological problem, as the Secretary of the Air Force has said. It is a bureaucratic problem. If you want to get serious about autonomy, you have to fund it seriously. Uh, so think about this. The, the F-117 went from a bar napkin through prototype, through test, into production, and reached IOC in six years, exactly on schedule. How was it able to do that? Because it was treated seriously, it was managed effectively, and it was developed with a sense of urgency. And if the Air Force can't figure out how to field CCAs within that timeline, call it five years, with trusted and effective tactical autonomy, then something has gone seriously wrong with our processes. We have the technology. We can do it. And I'll just leave you at this. We know China will on that timeline. You know how long it takes China to build an artificial island in the ocean? Seven months. So that's kind of the benchmark of performance we're looking at. In the two-year time frame, I expect Adair UX to be flying, and we're going to be learning a ton that we'll be able to roll into our CCA platforms and missions within that five-year scope. Yeah, to pick up on what Paco said and to answer your question there, Slick, what I would add are two things, platform and architectures. Number one, as is seen through the desire for a next-generation aerial dominance family of systems through the SecApps OI, I think that if we believe that our platform will solve all of our ills for CCAs, especially we think that they're going to be attributable and rapidly prototypable and rapidly fielded, I think that leaning on just our platform would be a mistake. And so family of systems would be a great outcome in five years. And the second thing to layer the autonomy in, you need a common architecture that all vendors and all platforms leverage. So you have that swappability of autonomy. You have a, a, that rapid adaptability, adaptability and development of those behaviors and capabilities. So the vehicles and the mission computers on board have to have that common architecture. They have to have the performance to do the mission that's required. And we need a family of systems in order to facilitate that. We can do all of those things in five years. So I'd like to switch the conversation a little bit away from the technology and focus more on the doctrine and the tactics, because you have to build the doctrine and the tactics if you, into the programming if you want the behaviors and the outcomes of the CCA. So we haven't spent as much time as a community really thinking about the unique attributes of humans, the unique attributes of the CCA, how we want them to literally team so how do we build those teams to exploit their unique strengths and mitigate each other's weaknesses and the literal interactions between the two of them? So we need to begin building the intellectual foundation now so that we can begin to program them into the CCA and then test and, and train with them in the real world. And I, yeah, I would just add to all of that, making sure that the AI brains, which are essentially software and algorithms, software algorithms, are married up with platforms is really the, the secret sauce. And, and that's something that I think the Pentagon has generally struggled with when you think about software development is how do you actually integrate that into the bureaucracy and make it a priority and not let it become a stepchild. And so programs like Venom or, you know, perhaps the Ghost Bat, where you're putting that AI brain in hardware and you're, you're actually experimenting with it are really important to kind of overcome the bureaucratic obstacles going forward. Well, I can't thank you all enough for being here. We've got two more episodes, and this is really going to be a great series. So it's been an incredible, interesting conversation so far, and I can't wait for the next episodes on this. So you guys are really talking about true next generation. This is the kind of technology we used to see in science fiction, and now it's becoming a real-world capability. Thanks, Slick. Appreciate it. Until next time, Slick. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Slick. As always, thanks, Slick. <laughs> With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. 
You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.